Vermont, sunny Miami. This is Dr. John Bennett, broadcasting for the Neurosurgical TV channel. Tonight, uh, Today, we have the pleasure of having John Otto, MD, a neurosurgeon from Aurora, Colorado. Uh, John is going to talk about the Chiari uh, syndrome, as well as his work with the Chiari Foundations. And we're joined with a couple of distinguished panelists. First, we'll introduce them before we turn it over to John. Hello, Rakesh. Hi, I'm Dr. Rakesh, a neurosurgeon from India. Uh, I'm very excited uh, that I'm a part of this uh, uh, presentation uh, and I'm looking forward for presentation uh, from the authority in Chari Malformation. Thank you, Rakesh. Welcome. And uh, Slavin, how are you today? Hello. Uh, my name is Slavin. I'm great. Thank you. Uh, here in Croatia and I'm a neurosurgery student uh, who is looking forward to this presentation from a great master of here. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Okay, John, welcome, and please tell us about yourself, your foundations, and uh, on to your presentation. Well, thank you. Well, it, it's it's a pleasure. I'm delighted. This is my first uh, experience. Um, I did my neurosurgical training at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. Finished. Uh, I joined the faculty in 1984 after my training, and. Um, in 1991, I became chief of the service for about 14 years. I then moved to Denver, Colorado, and uh, have worked here for a decade. And just this past December, I actually retired from surgical practice. I need to write a couple of uh, Chiari books and, um, and train some people, so I just found it was time to get involved in it in a serious way. In 1997-1998, um, you know, as a teacher of neurosurgery, I, I, I saw a few Chiari malformations in a row and um, presented a grand rounds. And you know when you prepare a presentation, you learn more. And I, I realized how we were not training well in the Chiari malformation and how there was a simplistic idea that you basically made some room back there and everything was going to be okay. The long and short of it is we started focusing on the disorder and word of mouth led to really quite a few referrals. So one of the reasons to move to Denver was to continue to grow this clinic um, and we've seen patients really from uh, uh, all over the country, a few from throughout uh, the world, but mostly we've focused in, on the United States. Um, so. It, it became a passion of mine, and I, uh, for many years, lectured to several of the Chiari organizations here in the United States. They're fundraising organizations, uh, but they're really good nuclei for uh, keeping up with, uh, with the trends in Chiari and educating others. Um, I've given many presentations on this disorder. Uh, past few years, I've been honored to be invited to uh, Sydney, Australia, Milan, Italy, and last year uh, Shanghai, China to present some of this work. Um, I'm going to give you a very specialized presentation. This assumes that uh, people have a general idea that it's a congenital malformation. And we're going to talk about Chiari 1. It's a congenital malformation with crowding at the base of the skull. Uh, that in many people leads to a syndrome of headaches, dizziness, blurred vision, cognitive dysfunction. And uh, we published 112 uh, patient outcome study back in 2005 using a verified outcome measure and shown about 87 uh, percent significant improvement of the quality of life. So you can help many of these folks. The problem is many neurosurgeons do a fine job but when the surgery doesn't go well, it actually becomes very di a difficult situation for the patient. Uh, in the past, I'd say maybe six years or so, we've sort of specialized on evaluating these folks that complain of ongoing symptoms of Chiari malformation, despite having one or, frankly, I've seen people having up to five uh, operations prior to uh, us evaluating them. So the challenge is, what do we do when it doesn't go well? Um, many of these folks, interestingly, have an undiagnosed 
uh, are a secondary condition like pseudotumor cerebri, occipital neuralgia, cervicogenic headache, possibly even cranial cervical instability. So we worked very hard to try to see if there was some underlying hidden disorder that can be uh, contributing to the ongoing symptoms. However, in a subset, the issue was that the surgery uh, was not effective or, or there was a problem during the surgery that led to the persistence of the crowding. Um, so basically, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can get the presentation going. Let me uh, select, I'm sorry, select here. And are, are you able to see something that says pits, pitfalls of Chiari surgery? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So basically, we're going to be talking about a posterior fossa decompression. I think most of us understand this. Most of us go back in this area. It's a posterior midline approach. The patient is in a prone position. Uh, head is supported with a three-pin headrest. And so, it, fortunately, the approach to this area is a commonly taught and known. The question is, of course, the, the subsequent uh, details. Um, so here is uh, the ideal. So on your uh, left is a significant Chiari malformation. We know that the tonsils are significantly herniated. In this case, down, I don't see. If you, I don't know if you see a pointer, but yes. in this case down to um, basically C2. Uh, here's uh, the opistheon, the basion, the end of the clivus, basion to opistheon, that's the foramen magnum. And the tradition, as you know, is we draw a line here and we look to see how far this tissue hangs. But more importantly, what we've recognized and, and some others in the field is, look what's happening to the medulla. The medulla in this case, now this is a severe case, granted, the medulla is markedly stretched. That's going to affect a lot of the tissue here. It is, this is an active malformation. Uh, even though people were born with it, once the symptoms kick in, over time, we've seen de increased deformation. Not in everyone, but we've seen increased deformation of the tissue. So in my mind, it becomes active at some point in time. And it's a hydrodynamic problem. It's the pulsations of the heart, the systolic pulsations that engorge the brain with blood. The blood, the brain expands. It has to get out of the cranium. The only way it can pulse, uh, and this has been shown on motion MRIs, it pulses down. So you've got this repetitive 100,000 times a day pulsation with a heartbeat, and you cough and sneeze, you jam this. So, so if we do an adequate decompression, remove some suboccipital bone, and I'll go into detail a, a little later. The back ring is C1, and uh, expand and do our duraplasty and create the new cisterna magna. Um, that's our ideal. But what's fascinating to me in these severe cases, it looks what, look what's happened to the brainstem in just really a couple of months. I usually get my first post-op scan two months post-op, this brainstem is not as stretched, not as distorted. Uh, I'll talk about this little grill here a little later, but that's a titanium plate, and we'll discuss that a little later. Here's another, same thing. I agree it's a serious uh, example, but it helps us understand. The tonsils are only part of the problem. They, they yes, they're markedly herniated. Here's the foramen. They're down below C1. And then there's kinking, anterior kink, and this beak posteriorly. This is due to sort of an elastic deformation of the medulla as this is caught on it and keep pushing it down. The best example I've heard to kind of think through this, many years ago somebody described it as walking on the beach and seeing that mound of sand in front of your shoe. Um, and so, uh, and then anterior, and some people they have a real retroflexed odontoid which narrows this area, so they'll jam up against this. And keep in mind, cardiac, respiratory centers, nausea, vomiting centers are in these areas. Of course, all the long tracks are in these areas as well. And again, it's fascinating that within a few months, you've got a much more normal looking medulla. 
and I hope in the future people that do research we can kind of correlate does this correlate with clinical symptomatology so today's presentation is going to be what are the key factors in failure in my view when somebody comes in and it seems like it's the surgery that failed we can usually attribute it to one of these issues now it's true some people may have more than one of these issues but oftentimes you can find a dominant problem that occurred and I'm gonna walk you through each one of these and if you'd like to interrupt me uh, as we go along that's certainly fine with me um, so the first decision the neurosurgeon has to make is well how much bone do we take off and here are textbook examples and you can see how different the recommendations are here's a wide decompression that's probably going to be close to six centimeters here's one that's marked as 2.5 centimeters unfortunately the drawing leaves bone right at the choke point I call this the choke point which is at the foramen posteriorly that's where our attention should be but but the bottom line is the teaching is very variable uh, <clears throat> and uh, just a second I'm going to just go through this real quick. Just a second. I want to find if I. Okay. Okay. Um, so. All right. So this decompression is very limited. Here's the bone. They've taken off bone here. They might have nibbled a little bit of C1. The bottom line is this decompression did not achieve anything significant. And the patient persists with the classic symptomatology. We work her up for other possibilities, manage those as best as possible. But the bottom line is this operation needs to be completed. This is an under decompression. They did not take enough bone. Um, and here's at surgery. Um, I'm going to show you this three uh, arm retractor. I, um, you don't have to use it. I actually now have gone back to a very simple McCullough retractor. But for some years, I used a modified spinal retractor by Nuvasiv called the Max Axis retractor. We had them customize some blades. It allowed me to get in there with a four centimeter uh, incision, but that's that's not crucial. So the decompression is maybe about two and a half centimeters. Uh, and in this direction, it's barely, if the foramen was here, it's barely a centimeter and a half. Uh, so that's inadequate, the bottom line is, and, and we, we know that. So through this retractor, I've taken off bone. And I don't have slides on this one to show you. But in an adult, I try to get at least three centimeters of transverse decompression at the foramen. And then the longitudinal decompression is anywhere from about two and a half to three, depending on the severity. Um, we, we open the dura. I can identify the tonsils. And I've, I've made a generous duraplasty. And this is autogenous uh, Dura. I'm going to show you how to get this in a fairly simple way. I don't know where the music came from. I don't think I hit it. Okay. So here is here is the subsequent follow-up. So now we have a an adequate decompression. We've given room at the foramen magnum. We've recreated the cisterna magna. Here's my titanium plate, which helps some of the muscular attachments, and it's why I use it. It's not essential, but I'll show you some further cases. Um, so that, that's a small decompression. If you see someone with that, then be gratified at least that you can solve, you're likely to be able to solve that issue. Okay, you just simply extend the decompression. Well, I took off C1, I gave her a generous duroplasty, and we have nice space. Now here's a challenging case. As you can see, it's a severe uh, malformation. The tonsils are pointed, the brainstem is elongated. She's 20. She cannot return to school. She cannot work. She cannot drive. Uh, I'm sorry, she gets a decompression. It's a fairly wide decompression. 
okay? It's fairly wide, very different from that other case, and a very large duroplasty. Uh, she continues to be miserable, unable to work, etc., as I've described. Um, and um, she sees her neurosurgeon. His response is, you're wide open. Uh, the, this lady is from Massachusetts. She then sees a second neurosurgeon in the community in Massachusetts, and the response from the surgeon is, you're wide open. Um, six, eight months later, she works her way to our clinic. I tell her, you're wide open. I uh, sit her down. I, I tell her that I'm going to gently put my fingers on this area here, and I'm going to gently press. And you could see by her reaction that you had just changed her world. You had pressurized her. I mean, the look on her face and that arching withdrawal just gave me the answer. She is too connected to the outside world. This is an over decompression and an over duroplasty. And yes, she's wide open, but she's terribly wide open. Uh, here is the uh, axial view. Basically, their scalp over this uh, duroplasty. Um, here is what I found at surgery that the duroplasty, or the decompression was about five centimeters. I did a reduction duroplasty. I actually took some of the dural patch and grafting out. I, I, this triangle here was sectioned and removed. I asked the company that I work with to make me a large Chiari plate. I designed these plates uh, 2004, 2005. I had to ask the company to give me a, make me a six and a half centimeter plate so I could bridge this area. Uh, this is the pre on the left. This is the post revision. You can see the plate here. Uh, very gratifying. Uh, she had some early bumps. She completed her schooling. She returned to work. She drives. She had a baby. And just about two months ago, I received another letter from her with her second child. So ch totally changed her life. So we can overdo the decompression is the message. Okay, and then one uh, other example of the bony decisions that we have to make is, is recent. Unfortunately, this lady went through a really troublesome series of surgeries. She was in an adjacent state to us. Uh, this is uh, um, what uh, she had had. Uh, let me tell you what she had through this. She had had a decompression. You can see the bone is gone. You can see there is a duroplasty. It did expand up here, but the choke point is not affected. I mean, the bottom of the funnel is still plugged. Okay, so obviously we're not going to change the dynamics to any real degree. They had decided to spare C1. You can see C1 there. So it's still choked, and unfortunately, she's got a continuously enlarging syrinx. Really troublesome situation. The surgeon, because the syrinx was uh, enlarging, she was um, had, water was uh, traveling up into the cord. You see the syrinx itself. What was done next is a two-level laminectomy, opening the dura, and a short little stent in the syrinx, um, syringo subarachnoid stent. Unfortunately, after that operation, in certain head movements, she would get this shock throughout her body. Uh, it was unpredictable and very difficult to live with this situation. So the surgeon performed a third surgery to take the stent out. She then got fairly disgruntled with the medical system and I think, uh, you know, did nothing over a year other than pain medications. She worked her way to see uh, us and uh, I basically just said, pointed out that, you know, you still have the crowding at the base of the skull. I went in there and uh, expanded this and, um, sorry, here it is and gave her this space and for the first time in a couple of years and this is a two-month follow-up her syrinx is a, so we change the dynamics up here once the syrinx starts disappearing keep in mind that the treatment of these syrinxes is up here it's not the syrinx itself if there's crowding here 
it's really been an advance over the past 15 or 20 years to understand that the real problem is here. There's my uh, plate. You can see it there. A nice, generous uh, expansion here. Unfortunately, she was probably a little tethered to the scarring from those two surgeries, but right now she's very pleased with her progress, and we're not going to do anything differently at all. Um, so, uh, again, some examples of how things are done differently. Here's a over decompression, what I call over decompression. Here's an under decompression. Uh, my standard approach is, again, in an adult, about three centimeters, and the longitudinal direction, anywhere from two and a half to three centimeters, depending on how crowded you see the images. Okay, I think that's a repeat, and I, that's what threw me off a little bit. Let me just move on. Sorry. Uh, work. Okay, so that's, um, you know, factor one. It's uh, how much bone you take off is crucial. Now, it, it would be nice if we could take off bone and not have to open the dura. And I do believe in a few cases that can be effective. Unfortunately, we tend to see the folks in follow-up where it is not effective. So in this case, the bony decompression, and I'll point it out in a second, was very adequate. Unfortunately, the dura was not open. So the suboccipits trimmed up to here. It would probably run here. And I don't see a C1. I see the C2 spinous process. Uh, so the bony decompression is from here to here, very adequate. But unfortunately, and this occurs, is the scarring and the thickening of these tissues. She still has her Chiari. She still has her Chiari. So again, this is one of these situations where you can really help. She just needs the operation completed is the way that I tend to think about it. And I let her know that. Um, so, here, um, so here is her CT. And I think it's the same patient. Uh, might be incorrect on that, but it's still an example of the same thing. And um, now I designed these uh, templates, so oh, I don't know, a number of years ago. Um, and these helped me get the autogenous pericranium. Um, I think I'll show you a little later, but I'll describe it now. You have your midline incision below the inion down to C2. Make the length that's comfortable for you because the length is not the main issue. And then above the inion, in a separate incision, I can do it in about two and a half centimeters, but feel free to make a three centimeter midline incision. You're going to find beautiful pericranium back there. It's just great. It's right in the nearby area. You don't need to go to the fascia lata or something else. I then lay a silastic template on there, and then with a needle tip bovi, these don't burn. This silastic just doesn't burn. It's amazing. I guess it's like shunt tubing. Uh, with a needle tip, I'll go around. I'll lay this on the, the periosteum, and I'll go around with a needle tip bovi, and then obviously the, then I'll take a periosteal elevator and lift this off the bone, and it's great tissue. I'm going to show it to you as we go along, and there's. You know, again, I uh, use that three-point uh, retractor, but here is the duraplasty that I gave to that lady. I use 5-0 uh, 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 monocryl, um, and uh, it, uh, in a watertight fashion, this is a crucial step. We want to keep leak rates down to 2% or less. Uh, leaks are uh, problematic in this disorder, and we spend our time on this. This is, a, to me, the most important step. Oh, they're all important, but that's a, certainly a crucial step. Here's another duraplasty, just to give you an idea, depending on the size of the deformity. It's a running uh, stitch. Um, you can stop and add a new stitch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now here's my approach uh, when I use this uh, minimally invasive retractor. I, the, the incision usually about four centimeters. You don't want to pick a very heavy patient to do this on. Uh, but a lot of patients are thin women or thin men, and it's very doable. Um, this is the, there are two incisions. There was an, there's an incision here at the posterior fossa. Here's to get the pericranium. Um, 
and I actually use a uh, five millimeter burr and, and shave this. Just shave it under the microscope, look for the color changes, get it thin, and then oftentimes you can break through with a little curette and then you're going to kerosen all this out. And look at this indentation caused by the bone in that area. And this is the exposed dura once you've taken it all out. Then I open in this uh, Y-shaped fashion, the dura, and it creates this triangle, if you will. Um, and then do the, whatever internal work you need to do, and we'll talk about that. You might not need to do any. But if you do, then you open the arachnoid, and we'll talk about that. I open the arachnoid. This tonsil is rolled into the lower part of the fourth ventricle. And so that kink that we see, uh, and I don't know if anybody's written about it, but we've got great photos of it. It's the gracilis and cuneatus nuclei. The, the tonsil hooks into this, and it just, it just pushes it on down. Um, this is Duracell. You can use other things. I've used other things uh, before. Um, it's unclear which is the best or whether you really need, you know, the tissue glue like I've used in this example. All right. So I hope I'm uh, not moving too quickly, but there is a lot to cover. Um, so now you're going to do a duraplasty. Let's say you've decided that you're going to leave the arachnoid closed. And that's certainly acceptable. Um, you know, you theoretically have less chance of infection, less chance of leak. On the other hand, leaving the arachnoid, if you're going to leave it and not open it, you better not have any holes in it, okay? So uh, that can lead to a problem. Here is a um, young woman, a college student, uh, top university in the United States, and she's had a Chiari decompression. You can see her Chiari on the left and you can see a decompression that was done by her initial surgeon and uh, she's no better she is no better uh, it's time to get thinking about getting back to school she's taking time off for the surgery and she just cannot cannot function well uh, she goes to her surgeon and, and like I said you know he, he indicates that you've got an adequate decompression uh, it's apparently a secondary opinion, if I remember correctly. And then she works her way to us, and I told her, you know, you've got a very nice decompression. Uh, then I looked at the operative note. Look at the operative note. And I noticed that they spared the arachnoid, which is fine. I mean, you know, anatomically it looks like a great decompression. But, but that that was a cause for suspicion that the arachnoid was uh, not open. I always, that just concerns me. So I told her, I said, look, you, you look wide open, but I'm going to do a Cine flow MRI scan on you. Cine flow. I don't always do those. I used to, and I'm sure some surgeons still do them in every case. I use it selectively nowadays, but I certainly wanted to do it in her. And only a few images looked like this, and, and I'll, I'll have to admit, even though he's a very good neuro, neuroradiologist, he missed these couple of images. So let's take a look. What we're seeing in a Cine is we're seeing CSF, and that'll change colors as you do the motion views. Um, but this should be, what, what's going on here? That's not white at all. I mean, that's not white at all. What is going on here? And I told him, I said, you know, I'm not sure, but I, I think this is either a arachnoid cyst or trap CSF or whatever. And the mother said, well, what else are we going to do? She can't go back to school. So I explored this. The arachnoid was preserved. I opened up the previous duraplasty or extended it. The arachnoid, certainly you can see, was preferred. Big hole here. And it's a little hard to see, but there was another hole right there. So she developed a subdural uh, hygroma. CSF pushed itself out here, got trapped, pushed the arachnoid back down on the tissues, and left her basically with her flow problem. In other words, the, the arachnoid, I mean, I'm sorry, the CSF got between the arachnoid and the dura, so a uh, um, uh, subdural 
hygromize is the technical term. So what's the treatment? Get rid of all this arachnoid. Okay, and that's you know, here's some of the membranes. Just get rid of it. Clean, clean the arachnoid in the local area out. We remove arachnoid from any things we do in neurosurgery. It's uh, not an issue as long as you get a good dural closure. Um, and um, basically got her back to college. I don't have a post-op right now, but you know, it's hard to imagine that it's going to look much different. So the arachnoid's the next step. Now, what about the neural tissue? Um, and in some cases, you'll want to shrink the tonsils. I don't have a picture right now in this set, um, but basically bipolar the tips dorsally. Um, avoid a lot of lateral bipolaring because you don't want it to scar on the edges. Uh, and reduce the tonsils as you feel indicated. That's really almost a subject of a separate talk. But there's an, an extra important step, and this is what I want to show uh, with this series. If the patient has a syrinx, I believe we should open the arachnoid and look between the tonsils at the foramen of Magendi. Okay, and that's this area, and you can see this person has a veil covering the foramen, and if we don't look, uh, we're not going to find it. Maybe occasionally in a high quality cine scan you might be able to see that there's no flow here, but most often. So here's a lady that was sent to me after a posterior faucet compression, and you can see she's got a huge syrinx. And as we know, if this persists, she'll eventually go into a wheelchair and have difficulty using her hands. But there's a decompression here. It was done. It was okay. Uh, it's adequate. But the syrinx did not respond. I looked at her operative note. There was no comment about the frame, exploring the frame of Magen D. Uh, so I actually thought maybe she'd just have a lot of adhesions here and I would break them down. And again, it was one of those situations where you don't have 100% evidence, but quality of life is so limited and affected and, of course, high risk in her situation with the syrinx. Um, and again, she's in her 20s. Um, and in, you know, in the 50s, these people uh, were called and developed what was called spinal paralysis and they just uh, live their lives in a wheelchair, unfortunately. So, um, and you know, I will show you these pictures. The adhesions, I feel, were small and not the issue. There's clearly an adhesion. It's got a little bit of vein coming to the arachnoid here. Uh, and then I think there was another area of adhesion off laterally, but not, not significant adhesions. So I looked between, and sure enough, there's a veil. And in this case, it's a complete veil. This is congenital. It, didn't, it failed to open, basically. Uh, and there's exposing the veil. This is, of course, your pica. You're going to be uh, seeing both picas uh, if you go subarachnoid and just have to be prepared for that. Uh, I'm taking a little beaver knife, and I'm opening the um, veil. Uh, that's the fourth ventricle. Here's a little cottonoid pledget. Um, a little assistance with a retractor there from the assistant. And there I think you can see the opening that's being created. Uh, this, and I, uh, I was frankly very surprised, this is a, usually it's two-month scan. Therefore, there's no question that the veil resulted in the persistence of this syrinx, because that's really all I significantly did. And if you look in retrospect, I didn't pick this up at first. Look at the difference in the fourth ventricle. Uh, so we, we've we got a dynamic here that, that the veil was driving the fluid instead of out, was backing up here and driving it into the cord. And then you break that mechanism and you have a very gratifying result. Um, now, fortunately on, in well, fortunately, unfortunately, on infection, I only have one slide because it's a mess. Uh, and I could show you more and more scarring. And fortunately, I haven't had to do many for infection. What I would say is a tight dural closure preventing the possibility of external leak and infection. And frankly, the meticulous care we need to take through the whole procedure of avoiding contamination, we've got to prevent infections. 
in this particular case, which is an early case, you can see I've opened up their previous, you can see their previous sutures to get in there. Badly scarred. I suspect I took at least two hours just breaking down the adhesions. Um, and frankly, she was not significantly better. So we, you know, there's some you can help, but bottom line is we want to avoid infections. And, uh, and I have no particular uh, answer other than meticulous tissue management. I was taught by kind of a senior uh, neurosurgeon from Yale, at least one of my professors, uh, who, whose prime was in the 50s and 60s. And he, he, would, he would slap my glove if, if he, he saw you touch the skin. And uh, uh, surgeon's hands are for instruments. And you know, that just stuck with me because the bacteria are often in the skin and sometimes we're a bit too cavalier with the skin. So I always keep the skin covered. I, I don't like to see the skin uh, exposed. Uh, those bacteria are just waiting to get into this protected environment and cause havoc, basically. All right, so this is a little bit of a different area. And it's a little bit of why would you want to rebuild? And actually, I need to sometime respond to a paper about a year or so ago that he posed that reconstructing the, the craniectomy uh, was not needed and just extra time, et cetera. I, I'm going to somewhat argue uh, counter to that. Uh, this is a paper from Japan, in, uh, although it has American author as well, in um, about the 70s. And they, what they uh, proposed is take the bone off with burr holes up here, do your duroplasty, and then put the bone back. The idea being, you know, provide support. Why? This is the only area that I know of that we take off bone and ignore it and just leave it alone. Uh, that always bothered me and about 10 years ago I thought, well, why aren't we rebuilding this area? And I'll show you what I, uh, what I worked on with uh, one of the W. Lorenz, which uh, is part of Biomet nowadays. So um, these are the plates that um, I developed. Initially this one, and it's still the workhorse, uh, these two are for revision cases that have had wide uh, decompressions. Um, this was a minimally invasive plate that I use in more limited. I don't use this very often. This is the workhorse. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, I developed a new one. I'll show it to you shortly. I still prefer uh, this. Uh, uh, they're easy to bend. They're, they're flat out of the... You, you shape them. You shape them to what you want. And that's a CT scan. I mean, they, you, they're about five or six little screws, uh, standard little bone screws that we all use, and it does, the key thing is to bend it out and not compress your duroplasty. You don't want it to restrict. And muscle is going to attach to some of this area. And these muscles are frankly very important. And one of the causes of persistent pain, I think, especially in the wide decompressions, is those muscles aren't doing squat. And the head is heavy on a tiny little spine. Um, this is my newer plate. I don't. Uh, it's a little stiffer. I I use it in selected cases. I design a midline marker just to help me make sure that I've got it as nicely midline. You can put your screws. And uh, again, if you consider these plates, and I have no financial interest in this. I, uh, the first year, back in 05, I taught for them a little bit for one year, but I have no financial interest. If you want to use them, I'd, I'd start with, uh, with the, uh, this, this plate here, their standard plate. Um, again, Biomet Microfixation is the company. It's worked. I mean, I've put in hundreds. Um, the, uh, this slide on wound closure, fortunately, I don't see this very often. And again, it's a single image to make a point. Um, this is actually a very problematic case. She's actually quite thin, has a reasonably uh, slender neck, uh, head is heavy and up high. And because of possibly, I can't say for sure, just a quick closure, she atrophied and sunk in. 
Um, I revised her, um, um, got her better for a short time, very happy. She sunk back in, and then we had to do a second uh, revision ourselves with the assistance of a plastic surgeon. Um, she's better, but I wouldn't say she's back to normal. So you really, you just want to make sure that um, we keep our focus uh, during the closure. The closure is not something we should delegate uh, to junior uh, staff. Uh, we can if we're there, certainly, but we don't want to certainly leave the room or anything like that. We want to make sure that you have at least a two um, layer closure to the muscle, a tight closure to the fascia, I do a subcutaneous closure, and then I do either staples or mattress nylon on the skin, depending. Uh, you just want to avoid this. It's a, it's a hard problem to deal with. And, um, and then the final uh, area, fortunately this is less common, is that sometimes people get these operations and we haven't recognized craniocervical instability. And granted, this has been more recognized in the past decade or so. Uh, there's more study. Uh, there's a lot of work being done on it. Um, and they may have a very good-looking decompression, but they hurt. Uh, they have headache pain. Um, and there are clues that might give you an idea that maybe a, a, a craniocervical instability was missed. Um, this was in one of my own patients. I've, uh, I've seen it in... Um, possibly a few of my own. I've, I need to crunch my data. I've done over 800 of these operations, QRI surgeries, and that's what I'm hoping to do this year. Um, but I had one uh, lady, a very healthy young woman, not heavy, no pseudotumor, etc. The decompression looked wonderful uh, anatomically, but she was she was not good. So I managed occipital neuralgia, we used physical therapy, we used this and that and the other, uh, occipital nerve blocks, no better. Uh, and then she came and visited me, she was out of state, she came back for a follow-up and she said, Dr. Oro, I saw someone wearing a halo and I looked at her and I thought, well, yeah, what are you trying to tell me? And she said, I thought, wouldn't that be good? And I just stopped, I thought, Oh my, what is she telling me? She's telling me she, her, she's not supporting her head because she wants something to support it. So look uh, online for traction test in craniocervical instability. I think everybody does it a little differently. But I basically had her sit in a chair. You come from behind. You cup her hands just below her ears, kind of the temple areas. You let them know this is all done gently. And you slowly lift the head. And you ask them how they feel. Feel. Um, some people will say, many people say, well, really no different. Um, others might say, oh my, can you just do that? And I said, no. And then you let them go slowly and then they feel their pain again. So that's a quick clinical test that can lead you to the fact that maybe you've got craniocervical instability. Uh, and I'll show you an author to look at. The workup is involved. But I do both, in some cases I do sitting MRI flexion extension views and measure angles at the skull upper cervical spine. Or when the insurance doesn't allow you to send them to a sitting MRI or there's not one available, I do, my radiologist and I think other radiologists can do flexion extension images um, using CT, supine CT, uh, to, to see what the craniocervical angles are. Um, the other thing, though, is when you're looking at the initial MRI, don't just focus on the neural tissue, which is, of course, very attractive to look at. That's your malformation. But get an idea. Is the arch C1 still there? Is something, do I see all the bones I'm expecting to see? And you can see this is a bifid C1. Uh, it didn't congenitally close. And I imagine you're going in there with electrocautery and not realizing that C1 is going to stop you and you go into the dura. So, um, so if you suspect it on an MRI, then do one of these 3D CT scans. I think most scanners should be able to do that nowadays. Um, although this is kind of at the lower end, marked anomalies. C1 is fused to the base of the skull. 
C2 is bifid, it just never formed. And actually C2 and 3 were fused kind of in a clipple file. Um, so again, keep an eye on the bony anatomy here because these people uh, may or may, this patient uh, is not going to have craniocervical instability usually, it's just a bifid, but this patient might and then it's something that has to be evaluated. Again, there are a number of ways to look at the bony anatomy. There's the grab oaks line. You're looking at uh, the odontoid kicking back. It's called retroflexion of the odontoid. Um, if you draw that line and this is greater than nine, then, then you've got an, a bony anomaly here. Uh, then there are complex cliboaxial angles. The lead right now in the U.S. is in Washington, D.C and his name is Fraser Henderson. Um, he's got a great paper where all these images come from and um, they're actually studying the deformative tissue stress in this area with varying angles trying to understand the pathophysiology, pathophysiology. as it's really a fascinating work that's, uh, that's in progress. Well I'm uh, kind of winding down in, uh, gosh, didn't realize it was 2011, um, but in 2011 we wrote this uh, review article focused on the surgery itself. Uh, and a nurse practitioner is the second author. Uh, she worked with me for many years, wonderful person. Simply called the posterior fossa decompression uh, and reconstruction in adults and adolescents with chiarion malformation. The hospital that I work at in Denver does not treat anyone below 14 years of age, so we don't focus on uh, children, if you will. And in this article, I make my arguments uh, on each of these steps. You know, what do you do with the dura? What do you do with the arachnoid? What are the pros and cons? Uh, so that, uh, even though it's 2011, that still holds basically our opinions. Our opinions haven't really significantly changed. Uh, so you can certainly follow. The other thing, and I hesitate to mention this because I'm not writing on it right now, but I hope to, uh, kiarimedicine.com is my website where I try to put some of this material up. Uh, so that's another source. Um, so my conclusion, I think, is going to be fairly wide, and, and that is each patient's presentation and imaging studies differ. So each, it's not a matter of we're going to go in there and make some room. It is what is, what are the patient's symptoms? Is there an associated syrinx? That together with what are this individual's imaging studies like? Uh, each Chiari is very different. You can have someone with severe symptoms at five millimeters, uh, you can have, without pointing, you can have marked distortion of the brain stem. So they're very different. So each case, you, you work through, what, am I, what about my bony decompression? Is this a case of dural opening? Uh, am I going to need to shrink the tonsils, therefore I have to open the arachnoid to do that? Is there a syrinx? Therefore, since up to 12% of people with a syrinx will have one of those veils, I better look for a veil. Um, uh, how are you going to close the dura? There are other people that argue for Gore-Tex, etc. Those are your choices. What's worked for us and several other large clinics in the U.S. is autologous pericranium. Um, and then, you know, do you want to reconstruct or not? As I tell my patients, it's not essential. If their bone is very thin, obviously the plate might come loose, so they're not going to get a plate. Uh, most people, though, I do put on a plate, and I've been very pleased with that. And then uh, uh, the final uh, comment is meticulous tissue management uh, and meticulous uh, closure. Um, so with that, I thank uh, all of you, and uh, happy to take any questions. Well, John, oh, that was a fantastic presentation. Man, oh, man, maybe I'll become a neurosurgeon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm doing my residency in Hangouts, so the time is a little tight. <laughs> time is a little tight, unfortunately, okay. John. Uh, just get off the screen share so we can see your face before we go. Okay. Uh, we have another uh, Hangout right now. Yeah, just click on the arrow again. Okay. okay. And uh, I'm sure the gentlemen have questions for you. If you don't mind, I'll give them your email address. 
uh, yeah. but it's just a fantastic presentation. I wish well, thank you. I wish you could do more. Uh, I really, I, I think the neurosurgical community would benefit greatly uh, by by presentations like that. Well, thank you. I know I Rashid. I know Rashid. Yeah. yeah. I, I know Rashid will echo that. Uh, Rashid, that was dynamite, wasn't it? Oh, I guess he's frozen uh, there. He's well, frozen I can there. I can say that it's really that this was so fantastic that I hope you will send series of presentations on the Chiari. Thank you. Uh, yeah, for we'll, have, we'll have to have another, we'll have to have more. Uh, but John, we got to go. Samer. Okay. Is, uh, well, thank you guys. What a pleasure. And uh, awesome yeah, I've got plenty of stuff. <laughs> fantastic, awesome John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. All. Take care.